Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. After gathering numerous samples around Jezero Crater, the Perseverance rover is awaiting the Mars sample return mission to bring its samples back to Earth and confirm the existence of life on another planet. But there's one small problem. NASA didn't have a clear plan on how to return these samples when it sent Perseverance in the first place, and now that they do, it's far too expensive for NASA to realistically afford. So what the hell are we going to do now? Well, first of all, we need to cancel this thing before NASA burns up any more funding that could be better used on other projects. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon once again. Welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Getting ready for my trip to Cape Canaveral here in a couple of weeks to cover the launch of Vulcan Centaur. I want to thank everybody once again who made all of that possible. You guys are awesome. Thanks so much for your generous support. And as I mentioned before, because I raised a little bit more than I was looking for, I was able to get a little bit more equipment to try to add some additional quality, not only to that coverage, but to other content that I can create in the future. But also on Monday, I'm able to travel to Cornwall and I'm going to be covering the new additions that have been made to the spaceport. In spite of what happened to Virgin Orbit, Spaceport Cornwall has been doing a thriving business and has been adding lots of capabilities to the spaceport for future customers and also even for current customers. The design does not require a launch provider in order for the spaceport to continue doing business. It was a great idea from the beginning and now that Virgin Orbit has gone bankrupt, gone out of business completely, well, the capabilities are still there. So I'm looking forward to bringing you all of these new details. Okay, on to the Mars sample return mission. It's very difficult to believe that NASA went forward with the Perseverance mission, the Mars 2020 mission, without having a clear idea as to how they were going to complete it, because the idea of the Perseverance mission was to not only gather and examine samples with the rover, a rover that was essentially little more than a copy of the Curiosity rover with some additional capabilities, but also to leave these samples behind, scattered across the Martian terrain as Perseverance made its journey around Jezero Crater. And the idea, of course, in the future was to have another robot come retrieve these samples and somehow bring them back to Earth. But the thing that's really frustrating is the fact that NASA didn't really have a clear idea as to how all of this was supposed to be accomplished. Well, now they finally do. They've had a solid plan for a little while now, and we've discovered that it's ruinously expensive so expensive as to be close to impossible to carry out given all the other expenses involved with Artemis. We're talking $10 billion, an insanely expensive mission compared to other robotic missions that have happened in the past. And there are so many complications, so many moving parts and different phases to this mission that there are many ways that it could go wrong and then you're just flushing $10 billion down the drain. And so the highly opinionated advocate for Mars colonization, Robert Zubrin, recently released an article saying that this mission really needs to be shut down. And he made a wide variety of recommendations on how we could look for life on Mars, confirm the presence of life on Mars without having to bring the samples back at all, and to do it for a substantially reduced price. And in addition to that, I'm going to be including some of my own opinions, along with sharing his and one of those opinions that I have is an opinion that Dr. Gilbert Levin had about the idea of sample return, that bringing back samples that may very well be brimming over with alien life might be a very dangerous thing to do indeed.
Ever since Perseverance set down on the Martian surface, indeed substantially before that, NASA has been trying to figure out how to do something that mankind has been unable to accomplish up to this point, and that is retrieve samples from the surface of Mars and return to Earth safely. Indeed, we have never sent a mission to Mars that actually was able to return. But we have done sample return missions in other respects, for example, returning samples from the moon, returning samples from asteroids and comets. We have been highly successful at carrying out these kinds of missions, but this is something else entirely. We're talking about samples that have already been gathered, already cached inside one rover, and somehow we need to transfer these samples to another rover or another spacecraft, and and then lift off from a planet that has a substantial amount of gravity, far more gravity than the asteroids that we've visited in the past, and substantially more gravity than the moon as well. And also, we're talking about a lot more distance to cover between Mars and Earth than the moon and Earth. So lots of unique challenges here, and as I said before, incomprehensibly, NASA did not have a solid plan as to how to accomplish all of this before they actually sent Perseverance. They just sent the robot and hoped for the best, which doesn't sound a whole lot like how NASA does things at all. Very strange indeed as to how all of this was carried out, but let's give you a few details as to how the Mars sample return mission is supposed to be carried out, at least as far as we understand it currently. Now, first of all, where are the samples? Well, the majority of them are actually cached inside the Perseverance rover. But incredibly, we're not certain as to whether or not a successful transfer from the Perseverance rover to another spacecraft or another rover can actually be carried out successfully. So as a result, a second backup grouping of samples are being deposited at a variety of sample depots. The first of these, the Three Forks Sample Depot, already has a number of samples deposited there. Now, depot is a grand term. The only thing that's happened here is the samples have been tossed on the ground, separated from one another by a couple of meters, and the reason for that is they want to give whatever is retrieving these samples enough room to work in without possibly damaging other samples in the process of picking them up. And by the way, since the Ingenuity helicopter has proven so successful up to this point, I mean, this is Flight 62 two that you're looking at right now. The mission now includes two Ingenuity helicopters to retrieve the samples and to bring them back to what's called a sample retrieval lander. Now this thing is pretty damn huge. It's approximately three and a half metric tons, about 7.7 .7 meters wide and 2.1 meters high when fully deployed. Its payload mass is double that of the Perseverance rover. In addition, in addition to that, it has to land extremely close to the Perseverance in order to be effective. We're talking about 60 meters away or so. This requires landing precision far superior to anything that has ever been attempted on Mars in the past. So we're already talking about a great deal of complexity. So the idea is to have the two Ingenuity helicopters go and retrieve the samples that have been deposited by Perseverance all over the Martian landscape. These are the backup cylinders though, keep in mind. The primary mission is to land the sample retrieval lander close enough to Perseverance to where it can transfer its cached samples over to the retrieval lander without the helicopters having to do much of anything. However, the more samples you can gather, the better. And if anything goes wrong with the Perseverance to lander transfer, you want to have other alternatives. So the helicopters bring the samples back to the sample retrieval lander, and then it picks them up and places them into storage. Now, the sample retrieval lander comes complete with an ascent element that once it's 
it's finished gathering all of its samples, it will rocket the samples up into orbit. There waiting for it is a European Space Agency orbiter, also known as the ERO, or Earth Return Orbiter. It includes a NASA-built capture and containment and return system and a communications package. The ERO will overtake the sample and capture it, and then once it has the samples carefully stowed away, it will return them to Earth and deliver the samples via an Earth entry vehicle similar to the one that we watched delivering asteroid samples earlier this year. Okay, sound complicated enough to you? Well, yeah, it kind of is. And there are so many things that could go wrong with this project. As I said before, a recent review of the plan revealed that the Mars sample return mission is going to cost at least $10 billion, and it may actually cost even more than that, which led Robert Zubrin to release his article just a few days ago. And I'm going to go ahead and quote extensively from it because I think he makes a lot of good points. Quote, while the decadal plan issued by the National Academy of Science Committee identifies the MSR mission as the top priority for NASA's Mars exploration program, a recent review of the plan pegged its cost at $10 billion, a price tag that threatens to preclude funding to any other exploration missions to the Red Planet for the next decade and a half. It is time for the rest of us to question whether the program of record still makes sense. Let's consider the alternative. For the same $10 billion now projected to be spent on the MSR mission over the next 15 years, yeah, it's going to take 15 years to even carry out this mission. We're talking about the samples arriving sometime in the mid-2030s. Anyway, I'll go on. We could send 20 missions, averaging $500 million each in cost. These could include landers, rovers, orbiters, drillers, highly capable helicopters, and possibly balloons or other novel exploration vehicles as well. Instead of being limited to one exploration site, these can be targeted to 20 sites and carry a vast array of new instruments provided by hundreds of teams of investigators from around the world. NASA claims that its Mars exploration program aims to search for life. However, the agency last flew a life detection experiment to Mars in 1976. With a robust program of this type, we could fly a dozen life detection missions to various locations and not only test the surface soil in various new ways for life, but drill down to search for much more life-favorable strata beneath the surface. With a robust program of this type, we could do many other things. Helicopters could carry sniffers to search for methane vents. Such craft could also scan the subsurface of the planet for caverns and hydrothermal systems using ground-penetrating radars. Most of Mars is underground. We should see what's there. For every instrument flown on Curiosity or Perseverance, there were 10 other good ones proposed that had to be excluded for lack of payload capacity. With a robust program of this type, many more instruments would get a chance to be flown. Not only that, but with plentiful missions in the queue, it would be possible to use the information provided by early missions to improve the engineering design of the exploration vehicles and identify the best instruments and target locations for follow-up investigations. The science return from such a rich and varied program would vastly exceed that offered by returning a few samples from one location on Mars. Zubrin goes on to point out that based on the success ratio of previous Mars missions, the Mars sample return mission has a pretty low chance of success anyway. NASA has flown 25 spacecraft to Mars, 20 of which have been successful, a mission success probability of 80%. The European Space Agency has a record of 2 out of 4 for a mission success probability of 50%. The MSR mission, as I said before, has two NASA spacecraft and one ESA spacecraft. If any one of those three spacecraft fails, the whole damn mission fails. This means to calculate the probability of success, one must put the success probability of each into series and multiply them together. So 80% 
times 80% for two NASA missions, 50% for an ESA mission, 32% overall, or about a 1 in 3 chance of success. But the most significant point, in my opinion, that Dr. Zubrin brings up is the fact that we have so many other things to do on Mars. In spite of all of the opportunities that we've had over the decades, we have yet to explore the most interesting places on the planet. For example, in the Valles Marineris, the deepest canyon in the solar system. This is an astonishing place, a place that would absolutely blow the minds of most people on Earth who have no idea that this canyon even exists. This canyon can be as deep as 8 kilometers in some places, as opposed to about 1.5 kilometers for the Grand Canyon. Can you imagine the spectacle of a rover trundling up to one of these canyon walls, or a Mars helicopter trying to ascend from the valley floor all the way up to the canyon rim. I don't even know if that would be remotely possible for one of these Ingenuity helicopters, but can you imagine how magnificent that would look? And also the geological diversity of this region and the potential for water ice and life for that matter makes this region especially interesting. And as I have pointed out in previous episodes, the Valles Marineris is an ideal place for Elon Musk to set up a future colony. If we go forward with the Mars sample return mission, we'll probably never explore this canyon, at least not in my lifetime, and not until the 2040s at the very earliest. That is simply unacceptable. There are so many amazing regions of Mars that have yet to be explored. We haven't even talked about the colossal volcanoes. Olympus Mons is just one of many that dwarf Mount Everest, and we have yet to even see the slightest hint of these volcanoes aside from orbital views. This is something also that needs to be explored in the near future and revealed to the public so they understand just how amazing a planet Mars actually is. And there is one final problem with the Mars sample return mission, which Dr. Zubrin would disagree with me vehemently about, probably. He believes that Martian bacteria will have zero chance of infecting Earth populations because a virus or a bacteria that evolved on another planet would have very little chance of being compatible with life on Earth. However, Dr. Gilbert Levin, who headed up the life detection experiment, experiments on the Viking lander has a totally different view. He believes that there's a strong possibility that our two planets have exchanged bacteria with one another through meteoroid impacts, and it's very possible that Martian bacteria could be similar enough to earthbound diseases to present a very serious threat. At the very least, the Mars sample should be returned to a quarantine lab orbiting the planet, or more preferably, orbiting the moon. Because keep in mind, the Lunar Gateway, one of its primary missions, was to serve as a quarantine lab for any possible infections that might come from another planet in the solar system. We should make use of that lab on the Lunar Gateway, assuming this mission goes forward at all. But I hope I pointed out, with all of these different drawbacks that Dr. Zubrin has identified, along with other problems with the MSR mission, that really we should rethink it. We should look at all the different missions that we could carry out for the same price and consider what's going to give us the maximum return from the Red Planet. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and please subscribe. It's so important to the future of my channel. And also please consider supporting this channel through Patreon and other methods that you can find in the description. And as always, stay angry about space.